morning, everybody. How are y'all this morning? Good, good. Well, I can say this. Um, my tooth is not hurting this morning, so I should be able to preach. Um, I had a root canal. I got a temporary crown. I'll go a couple days and get the actual crown. I, I know it was so bad. I was hurting so bad. I don't even re really remember preaching, so um, I apologize for that. But Christian did a great job last week. I watched that message online. Um, so we are in this series, um, just big journey, right? A clear vision. God gives Joshua a clear vision, and uh, it's, it starts a big journey for those guys. So we're going through the book of Joshua. This is week seven of, I don't know, 40 weeks or something like that. I don't remember. Um, and so we're looking at a couple of verses today. And so we're going to begin to talk about um, just the things that God starts to implement and do as they start to move forward. We've, we've looked at them. They were on uh, the, the wilderness side of the Jordan and um, just all that God did there about the two and a half tribes staying behind. Uh, their promise was to go with them, so they've taken all of the men. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about when they stepped in the Jordan, how the Jordan stopped and the water piled up, which would be just an incredible thing to witness. Um, and, and as they crossed, uh, the, God allowed the water to come back. They put up the uh, the the... The stones that uh, served as a reminder, not only in the Jordan, but on the side of the Jordan and just what those indicate. We've looked at all of that. And now they are right on the precipice of moving in. They've entered into Canaan right there at Gilgal, which is just outside of uh, uh, Jer uh, Jericho. Sorry, my Trying to think of all the words. It's a bunch, man. Um, and so they are right on the edge of, of beginning this campaign. And so God does something kind of interesting. And really, it's, it's just two verses that we're looking at this morning. And it's something that you would just read past and not even really think about. Um, but really, Christian talks about how, how, um, how we need to get the meat off the bone, right? I, I like the image of, of wringing the scriptures out. We need to wring these verses out and get all that we can out of them. And so in Joshua 5, verses 10 through 12, there's just a, 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 just a quick little statement. But in it, I think, reveals so much if you begin to look at it. And so it's... It's, it kind of goes back to the promise that God gave um, his people about the promised land, about the nation, about their inheritance. And, um, and so this inheritance was promised many, many years before, right? It, it starts in Genesis 13. God makes this promise to Abraham. If you have your notes, you can follow along. Um, the verses are not in the app, but if you have your apps, you can pull that up. And um, so in Genesis 13, God initiates this promise to Abraham and his descendants. Right? It's a promise of this, this promised land, this place for them to, to grow and be a nation. And so in Genesis 13, um, it says, The Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth so that if one can count um, the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. Right? So God makes this promise to Abraham that, listen, this land, this promised land is, is going to be yours. It's going to be more than you can possibly imagine. I'm going to bless you so much that the, there's just going to be more people than you could ever possibly imagine. Right, and so he reinitiates this promise to Abraham's son Isaac. Right in Genesis 26, it says this: "It says, sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father." So he reinitiates that with Isaac. He does it again with Jacob. Um, in Jacob, uh, I'm sorry, in Genesis 28, it says, And behold, the Lord stood, stood above it and said, I am the Lord, your, uh, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. 
The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Right, so God initiates this promise with Abraham, again with Isaac, and, and also with Joseph. So he's, it's this covenant agreement that if you follow me, if you put your faith in me, if you trust me, I've got this promise for you, and it's, it's building. It's, it's growing. It's, it's, it's moving forward, right? And then so uh, Joseph reestablishes or reminds everyone of this promise. In Genesis 50, it says, And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Right? So Joshua, or I'm sorry, Joseph reminds the people, reminds his brothers, hey, we, we're, we're doing something here. We're working on this. And so after Joseph's death, the, 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 the Israelites kind of were taken into slavery. They, they began to multiply so quickly, the Egyptians started to worry, well, wait a second, they're going to take over our land. And they put them into slavery so that they could stay Lord over them. Right? And so that's where we are kind of as we began the story. Moses goes to Pharaoh, um, says, wait a second, we're going to leave. God's taking us out. We're right on down the road. And uh, we know how that story went, right? They had to cross the Red Sea, um, went into the wilderness. We talked about that in the beginning of the book. They were in the wilderness for 40 years, um, mainly because they didn't trust God to begin with. What was an 11-day journey was a two-year journey. And of that two years, they refused to cross over. And so God said, all right, we'll just make it a whole generation. So they were there for an additional 38 years to get rid of that generation so that the next generation could go in. And so this promise again was reestablished in Exodus 6 with Moses. Um, it says this, it says, They say therefore, God is talking to Moses, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession for I am the Lord. Right? So this promise is not only given, it's reestablished on multiple instances and they are on the precipice of entering into that promise. Right? They've already entered into the land. They crossed the Jordan, right? The, the Ark of the Covenant was moved into the Jordan. The Jordan stopped. They crossed. They're at Gilgal now and they are right on the edge. Now, God had to do a couple of things, right? Last week, Christian talked about they had to be circumcised, right? That generation had got away from the circumcision. So um, there was that to deal with. So um, I'm sure that took a little bit of recovery. Or, you know, I mean, no one's going to fight like someone who's hurting. You, you know what I mean? So, hey, there's that. Anyway, okay, let's move on. Man, I thought that was funny. Y'all aren't even laughing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when you start talking about circumcision, everybody's like, mm, 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 mm. Yeah, mm. Let's not talk about that. Right, this great promise um, is just right on the verge of being fulfilled, right? Um, they just survived 40 years of, of, tra of in the wilderness. Uh, they're camping in Canaan, right? And, and just right outside of, uh, 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 of uh, Jericho. Gosh, I keep wanting to say Jordan, but anyway, okay. Many, many, many things are about to change for Israel, right? For the people. Um, just their, their entire lives are going to change. Now, this generation, if you think about it, this generation that has, that has entered into this land, all they know is the wilderness. Maybe some of them are old enough to remember being small, very small in Egypt, right? Um, and so they don't... They know nothing except living in the wilderness, 
right? So their lives are going to change. They don't know what it is to live in a land that's fruitful because all they have ever experienced is either slavery as a small child or living in the wilderness. They don't know what it is to grow crops. They don't know what it is to live in a land that can feed them rather than God having to feed them every single day. So they're their, their lives are going to change. They're going to have cities. They're going to have infrastructure. They're going to have to establish a government of some kind. I mean, they, everything is fixing to change. So I can only imagine the, the, how big this is for them. The only thing that they can do is, is just simply trust God. Right? They're going to begin to fight battles. Um, they're going to receive this inheritance and begin to settle down. They've never done that before. Um, now, the great thing is that they're going to be able to enjoy this blessing that's been promised all along. So I'm sure that was motivation. Um, and, and one of the major changes, again, it's a, it's a major change. But for us, as we read it, we just think nothing of it and we read right on past it. But for these guys, it's going to be life changing. And in the verses that we're fixing to read, what it says is the manna ceased. These people have never done anything except eat manna every single day that God gave them. So the fact that that was going to go away, I mean, uh, imagine, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think what, what a good illustration would that, I mean, just if, if someone gave you something every single day and you just kind of depended on it at that point and all of a sudden it's not there, it's a huge change, right? Um, they're going to have to begin to rely on their own abilities, right? Their own um, now, they're also going to have to rely on, on God's provisions, but it's changing, right? And so I, I want to kind of look at that because that's interesting to me. The manna is interesting to me. Y'all might not think it is, but it is to me, so you're going to hear about it. So again, the next time that you're on Jeopardy, you'll be able to answer the questions. Okay. So in Joshua 5, verses 10, we'll pick it up there. Here's what it says. Let me read the verses, and then we'll begin to kind of ring out these scriptures. Okay, it says, uh, While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain, and the manna ceased the day after they ate the produce from the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan. So this manna that God had been providing every single morning at night that they would go and gather and eat, that was their mainstay for, for nutrition and eating. Um, that was going away, but they were able to eat um, the produce from the land that they were in, right? This unleavened bread, they hadn't had, had unleavened bread in 40 years, right? Parched grain, I don't even know what parched grain is. It doesn't sound very good, but I'm thinking in my head it's something that they didn't have, right? Um, think of something that you really like that you hadn't had in 40 years. Some of these people probably never had it before. Imagine if a 40-year-old ate bacon for the very first time, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, right? So... You get the imagery, right? Okay. So, but as the people traveled through the wilderness, um, the, there was no place that they were able to really um, uh, farm or, or they, they didn't have the ability to generate food. Imagine how much food it would take to feed 2 million people. It's a massive amount of food. And they were constantly traveling through the wilderness, so they never had a chance to plant crops and, 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 and grow crops and those kinds of things. Now, they had livestock, but that livestock, I mean, how well were they able to breed the livestock for food? I mean, they probably were just breeding to keep their herds um, in, in enough number to where when they were done and got done moving, they could start to, you know, grow more livestock. You, you follow me here? They're constantly on the move. So their ability to generate this infrastructure to feed all this people wasn't going to happen. And so what they could do, they tried to do, but eventually it came to a point that, that they needed help, right? Um, in response to their need for food, 
God moved in a supernatural way and, and, and began to give them this substance called manna. Right? And it came down from heaven at night, uh, and they were to go and get it and gather it and, and eat that because that's what was going to sustain them. Right? Um, God sent manna every day the whole time they were on this journey in the wilderness. So for 40 years, they had this manna. Now, it says that God also did some other things. I think at a couple of points, he gave them birds, so they had a little bit of meat, so it wasn't just these cakes that they were eating. So God provided all kinds of ways, but, but it was manna that was the supernatural thing that just showed up every day. They didn't have to grow it. They didn't have to farm it. They didn't have to do anything. It just kind of showed up in the mornings. It's, it's an amazing thing. And, but the manna represents something even more amazing, right? And so the fact that this manna ceased um, is kind of a big deal, right? So I want to I look at this, at, at manna, right? I want to examine that and kind of ring that out. So if you have your notes, if you have your apps, pull that up. Um, we've got a couple of fill in the blanks. So the first thing I want to look at is what the manna pictured, Right? What, 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 what did it picture? What was it a representation of? Well, if you look at, um, to, to, to kind of see that, we need, to, we need to go back a little bit to the book of Exodus. And I'm just going to kind of highlight this. But if you were to read Exodus 16, it talks all about the manna. Right? So the manna was given as a response to the people's complaining. Right? It's just how it is. People are never satisfied. So um, when God gets them out of Egypt, they cross the Red Sea. God closes up the Red Sea on the Egyptian army. They celebrate for about a minute. And then all of a sudden they start complaining and whining. Well, well what about all the food we had back in Egypt? Man, we had meat and all that. And so uh, whining and whining. And so God's like, all right, cool. You're going to whine. Here, just trust me. I'll feed you. So he begins to give them this this manna that, that shows up every single night. God tells Moses he's going to rain bread from heaven. And that's what this manna was. It was a bread-like substance. Also, he tells in verse 4 of chapter 16 in Exodus, he tells Moses that this manna is going to serve as a testing for the people. Right? God is going to use their response to this manna to test their obedience to his law. Will they trust me? Will they rely on this? Will they be comforted? Is this going to sustain them? Right? I'm going to provide every single day. And how is that going to look? Right? And so it was a way for God to, to test his people. Will you trust me? Will you put your faith in me? Right? And so in the next, from verse 14 to 35, these 21 verses just tells um, here, in these verses... It talks and describes the manna, and when it talks and describes the manna, it's describing the face of Jesus. Let me show it to you. So in your notes, the first thing it says is that it was small. The manna was small like flakes that would show up every day. And so the fact that it was small, it reveals Jesus' humility. Right? Jesus was the creator of everything, right? He was the word. Everything was spoken into existence by him and through him. So he's the creator of all things. And the fact that he was going to come and save us, he came as nobody. Humbled himself as a servant. So the fact that this nutritional thing that God was giving the people, and it was very small, reveals Jesus' humility. He humbled himself as a servant so that he might die on the cross for our sins. The next thing it says is that it was white. It was like pure snow. Well, that reveals Jesus' purity. Right? Jesus was not um, born through human sin. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. It's the only way that he was able to die a sacrificial death on the cross for us because he was sinless. That's right. right? So this white, this pure thing reveals Jesus' purity. Right? He was without sin. 
that he might die on the cross for sin, as it says in Hebrews. Right? Only a sinless man could do that for us. He was spotless. So it was small, it was white. Here, this one is kind of cool. It came at night. Remember, Jesus was born at night, right, in the city of Bethlehem. So it would come at night. The people would go to sleep. They'd wake up the next morning. There it is, right? Jesus came at night. It was a humble thing. He was born in a stable. And, and so it, it was just this uh, kind of thing that happened. And he came into a world that was trapped in spiritual darkness. So he came into the world at night because spiritually it was dark. And he is the light. Right? So it was small. It was white. It came at night. But more importantly, this is kind of cool, it, it, it was misunderstood by those who found it. Right? When they found it, the, the, the word manna means, what is it? Right? It's like, you remember that candy bar, the whatchamacallit? What do you call it? Oh, whatchamacallit? Huh? What? What do you call it? Whatchamacallit? I, I know whatchamacallit. That's what I'm asking you, right? So manna, every day, hey, do you get your, they get your, what is it? Yeah, I got what is it? What is it? It's, it's what is it? I mean, right? I mean, so the fact that it was called manna means what is it? They didn't know what it was. They were like, hmm, what is it? Let's go see it. Mm, oh, it's good. Yummy. You know, I mean, don't know how that happened. Other than God told Moses, I'm going to do this. So Moses tells the people, go and get it, right? But it was misunderstood. They didn't know what it was. In the same way that the wise men, they didn't know what they were doing. They just knew that they were to follow this star, to go to this child and bless him because it was something amazing. More importantly, the people that Jesus came to save misunderstood Right? And so it was this thing that was just simply misunderstood. Jesus was misunderstood to the very people that he came to save. That's what it says in John 11 and John 10. Right? And so this manna, it was small. It was humble. It was white. It was pure. Um, it, it was born at night into a, a world of spiritual darkness. And it was misunderstood. But... The next thing is that it was sufficient for every person's need. Amen. For 40 years, the manna was sufficient for young people, for old people, and for everyone in between, for male, for female. The manna was right for everybody. I mean, think about for 40 years, right? So these young children grew in to become, the young boys grew in to become men off this manna. The young girls grew to become young women. And I say young because 40 is young, really. I mean, it's 50 is still young. Yeah, 52 is young. Look, look at me, right? But it was off this diet of manna every single day. Um, so it was sufficient for everyone's need. It was good enough to sustain life for the entire nation of, of Israel for 40 years. That reveals Jesus' sufficiency on the cross to save everyone. It was also sweet to the taste. In Exodus 16.31 it says it, was, it, it tasted like wafers made with honey. I like wafers. So that would be amazing. Right? I mean, you, you know those sugar cone cookies, the, the wafer cookies, the pink ones and the chocolate ones? Those are amazing, aren't they? Think, of, think about those sitting all over the place. It's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing, right? I mean, that would be yummy. So it's, it, it's good to the taste. But then so is Jesus. It's a great picture of Jesus. Listen, to the, to the center, Jesus appears to be harsh. Right? A, a, a cosmic killjoy who delights in keeping people from having fun. But if you've ever received Jesus, you know that sweetness. Amen. You know that joy of taking him in. You find that Jesus makes life worth living. Amen. Right? Um, 
The songwriter says that every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Or the psalmist says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. That's amazing because it's sweet. Jesus is sweet. And then lastly, is um, it was to be kept and passed on to others. So the instruction for the people when the manna came was that the men were to go out and to gather the manna, right? And they were to gather an ephah. An ephah is about a quart and a half, just under two quarts, like a jar of manna. And so they were to eat all that they could, that all that they would need, and they were to gather it and feed their family with it, right? So this ephah was able to nourish and feed everyone and satisfy everyone in the home. And what wasn't eaten, they were to give out to someone else who maybe wasn't able to go out and gather. So it was to be brought in and kept and shared. It was to be given out. In the same way that when we receive Jesus, we're not only to keep him to ourselves, but we're to hand him out to others. We're to bring others. We're to speak of his love, speak of his forgiveness, speak of the grace and mercy that we receive. That This blessing to us is not to us, it's through us. And that's what the manna was to do. It was to not only feed the one gathering it, but it was to be shared with those around them. And so it was small. It was white. Right? It was born at night. It was misunderstood. It was sufficient for everyone. It was sweet. And it was to be shared with all. Right? Jesus is to be shared with all that cross our path. Right? This is something I've said Many times I've preached on it. But listen, everyone that you set your eyes on <coughs> is someone for whom Christ died. That's right. He died for all. And so we're to share what we've received with others. You follow me? You get in the picture? So here's the fill in the blank if you haven't got it at this point. The manna serves as a brilliant picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. It reminds us of who He is and what he came to do. And listen, if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never repented of your sin and bowed to him and, and, and asked for his forgiveness, now's the time. In the same way that God provided the substance to feed these people, he provided a way for us to be fed through Christ Jesus, Amen. spiritually, Amen. eternally. Right? You need to come to Jesus. That's the picture that we find in the manna. Right, so that's what it pictured. Let's look at what the manna provided. I mean, we kind of touched on it a little bit, but so for 40 years, the people ate this manna and they, will, they were able to live, right? It was, it was nourishing. It was, it, it was, here, 40 years is roughly 13,000 days that God did this for these people. As they gathered it, they cooked it, and they ate it, and it provided life, right? It fed them. It kept them alive, right? In Numbers 11, it says this. It says, and the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills and beat it into mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was like the taste of fresh oil. So when they would pick it up, this is so, God, it's so amazing. Check this out. So um, it, it on the ground, you could pick it up and it was sweet like honey. But if you gathered enough and started pounding it in and fried it in a pan, it tasted like fried toast. Right? It had that fresh oil. So imagine, imagine with me, taking a big old thick slice of Texas toast, Texas bread, big thick slice, putting some bacon grease on it and frying it in a pan. That's what you eat every single day. God is so good. <laughs> Right? That's amazing. And so it was this amazing thing that was so versatile that you could use it for whatever you needed to. You could grind it into bread. You could fry it. You could bake it. I, and I mean, and just God is so good like that. But it provided life. 
The manna is what kept them from starving to death in the wilderness. It was really, literally, the difference between life and death was this manna. Again, in this aspect, the manna is a representation of Jesus. Like the manna that sustained the Israelites in the wilderness, Jesus sustains those who come to him. Right? Um, and so here I want to look at two things that in, de, in the description in Exodus about the manna. That there's two things that I want to look at that, that also pictures um, just um, the very thing that Jesus provides is life. But here. So they were to gather it by stooping because it was on the ground. And so this, this life-giving substance could only be obtained by getting on your knees, humbling yourself, and receiving it. But not only that, it had to be taken in. Right? It was received by stooping and it was received by eating it by taking it and by swallowing it in the same way that we come to Jesus by kneeling before him and humbling ourselves before him and that's all good and fine but we need to take him in we need to take in his word we need to take his life into our life his will into our will his forgiveness his mercy his grace we need to receive that and take that in and feed on his word every single day because that's what sustains life. And so when we receive him and take him in, it is this life-giving thing. Right? The manna was gathered by the men of the tent. It was brought into the tent and it divided according to the number of the people of the tent. And the manna was there, but it could not do anything for anyone if it was not eaten. This speaks of Jesus. Right? Listen, you can come to church. That's great. You, you, can, um, you can carry a Bible around. You can even read some of the Bible. Um, you, you, can, you can listen to sermons online. If you're going to listen to sermons online, go to Facebook, Meadowcrest Church, and listen to those sermons because they're the best. <laughs> Or you can go to MeadowcrestChurch.com and listen to those sermons there, which they're the best also. It'll take you to Facebook. But anyway, okay, you, you follow me, right? But you could do that, and that's all good and fine. You can sing songs with our worship team. They're amazing. You can pray up here at home on your, in your car. You can do all those things. You can do all the religious stuff that you want to, but if you're not taking Jesus in, it does nothing for your eternity. It does nothing for your life. He has to be received humbly and taken in. The manna provided life. Right? He saves. Jesus saves. Acts 16.31 says, And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. John 3, 3, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. To be born again, we have to receive Jesus and be baptized. Right? Romans 10, 9 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He repeats this in 10, 13. He says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, you have to not only stoop down before him, but you have to receive him. It's an amazing thing. The manna provided life in the same way that Jesus provides life. So you can see this picture of the promise that's to come in the manna. And it did the very same thing for those people that Jesus does for us. 
right? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever read, the, read about the manna and just thought, well, it's something that God did. Well, how cool that he fed the people. But not only that, he was revealing Jesus in this. It's an amazing thing. It's called a Christophany. It's a pre-appearance of Christ. And so it's this thing that we see Jesus in the Old Testament here. Right? It, it happens many, many times. But this is just one of those overarching things. But here's the thing. You've you got to be, you, you be reading. You've got to be looking. You've got to be digging. You have to be wringing those scriptures out. And so the fact here, the fact that this manna is fixing to cease could be a very scary thing or a pretty amazing thing. Because why would the manna cease? It's either God is removing it or God's provided something better. Right? In the same transition from the Old Testament, which was the promise of Jesus, into the New Testament was the reception of Jesus. And so they're fixing to enter into this promised land where they don't need to feed the little bits and pieces of Jesus. We won't need to read our Bible one day because guess what? We're going to be with him and we can ask him. Amen. That's going to be good stuff right there, yeah? Amen. So the manna provided life for those who ate it. 1 John 5.12 says, Whoever has the Son has life. And whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. It's that simple. So the manna provided life. Um, again, Jesus provides the same thing to his people. So, so it, the manna pictured Jesus. It provided life like Jesus. And so let's look and see what the manna promised. It promised what was to come, right? It was the promise of hope. The fact that it says the manna ceased the day after the ch children of Israel ate the fruit of Canaan, right? Every day that same little piece of bread was making a promise that a better day is coming, right? You're headed for a land flowing with milk and honey, right? You're going to go to a place of blessing where all your needs are going to be met. We have that in Jesus. Right? The manna was the Lord's way of promising Israel of a better life and a better land. We have received that promise in Jesus. Right? Um, now, from a, from a kind of from a different aspect, when they entered into Canaan, they began to, to, to take in a new diet, right? The desert diet was over. The little bits, the little bits of promises, the visions, the pictures, right? The, the, the promise to, to stay true, stay true, stay true has been revealed and been given, and now they've received the promised land. They're receiving all of the blessing in this promise in the same way that we receive it in Jesus. So the manna promised hope. Right? Right? So, how do I want to go here? Because I, I want to go down a road that, that's pretty harsh, um, but I don't need to. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm struggling here because I, I got two different ways I can go. Let's talk about a, a desert diet. Right? A desert diet is a meek, minuscule thing, just enough to get by, right? So for 40 years, they were just enough to take in, just enough to get full. And here, this is the kind of the cool thing. The manna itself, right? Whatever they gathered, if they went out at the, and gathered an ephah and said, you know what, I, I want a little extra tea, and they went out and got the extra and then brought it home, whatever they didn't eat that day went bad overnight. It grew worms and began to stink. So it wasn't, you couldn't save it up. You'd have to go out and gather it the next day. So it's not like they could just put stockpiles of this stuff. They had to trust and rely every single day on that. Um, but we don't have to do that in Christ Jesus. We have all that we would ever need and then some. He blesses us beyond our our understanding. So the manna promised hope, but it's a hope that's received, 
right now we still walk in hope of what's to come but in so doing listen to me when we trust in what's to come and we know what's going to happen and we're secure eternally listen everything that we could struggle through here is irrelevant to what's to come and we can endure all things through Christ because we know of what's to come we're we're in this place we know and trust in the promised land, so we don't need to struggle here so this hope that was promised for us is received. You, you, you see this picture here? And so we don't have to meagerly get by. We can feast richly on the Word of God and know and trust the promised land. Right? I'm not... Here, this... When you find yourself in your own Canaan, right? In that place of spiritual victory and power, I mean, we, we have those times. You, you, you lay down the meagerness of, of trying to get to that place. Here, let me, let, me, let me try to say this better. Have you ever felt like your walk with Jesus is dry? Right, that it's just not, God's not, I mean, He's just not coming through the way you need Him to, or, or, or you're, maybe you don't feel His presence very well, and, 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 and you're, you're just eking by, you're struggling to get by. Um, and, and then when we get into that place where God is really beginning to be richly, and, 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 or He's in you richly and, and blessing you, right? It, it's, you don't have to worry about the, the desert diet anymore. You get to feed on Him richly in that moment, right? And, and so, um, we can put away the manna because we have the promise. You get the difference here, right? Um, and so we can move into that place. In the same way, follow me here, in the same way that the Israelites were able to put away the manna because they were in the promised land, they could put away their past. You and I get to put away our past because we're in the promise with Jesus. Right? That's a good thing. So the desert diet, right? I know I've kind of transitioned that the desert diet's a bad thing, but, but here's the great thing about that. It represents both. It's, you don't have to eat by anymore. You're in the promised land. You don't have to, to, to hang on this promise. We have it now. We can receive Jesus. It's wonderful. It's an amazing thing to be saved by the grace of God. But sadly, a lot of us are aimlessly wandering around. We're still in the desert. When Listen, there's not even a Jordan to have to cross. All we have to do is just go. And receive Him, right? I, I mean, we live too far from the promise when there's no problem to get to the promise, right? I mean, it's like we're okay with being stuck. And we don't need to be. It's already given. We just have to receive it. right? And listen, there are those that... And I say us because sometimes I experience this, and I'm sure you probably have too... We're saved, right? We love Jesus. We know Jesus, but we, we're, we're walking in far too little power, far too little victory, far too little um, just of all of the things that God would want, the fullness, the blessing, the glory, the victory, all of those things. It's, just, it's, it's like we're just shy of, of what all is there, and all we have to do is just, just lean into it. Right? Just move into that place. See those blessings. See that. You follow me here? I mean, I hope you're getting, you know, we're on board. We're on the same page. God wants to lead you to a place of bounty in, in your walk. It's what he's continually doing. And even though we may struggle at times... Um, there is always a blessing. There's always something to be thankful for. Even in the hardest times, it, 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 here's what Paul says, that, listen, even in the hardest times, I'm going to give him thanks because he's, he, he's, he's looked at me and says, Hank, you, you can do this. You can, right? even, even whatever 
I have to endure, it's because God would count me worthy of having to endure it. So the fact that He's with me is, is thanks enough, even in the hard times, right? Even in the wilderness. There is a place where God is near. There's a place where God is precious. There's a place where what He is doing is exciting, right? There's a place where He is more glorious than anything else, and it's just simply in His presence, right? The manna pictures Jesus' incarnation, his, his promise. But more importantly, when the manna ceases, it's not because the promise has gone away, it's because we've received it. Um, the wealth of Canaan speaks of Jesus' resurrection. Right? The, the wilderness revealed the manna, which revealed the coming hope. And when that manna goes away, it's because they're feasting on the land that has more than they would ever need. And that is us receiving Jesus, right? It's His promise. It's His incarnation. It's His death that took care of us. But it's His resurrection that we put our trust in and we feast richly on. It's kind of a cool picture, don't you think? Um, so there's a lot more to manna than just a white flake that they ate on. It's an amazing thing. Here's what Paul says in Philippians 3. He says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through the faith in Jesus. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to be with Jesus. And everything that I may have or lose or experience or go through or suffer or even enjoy, I count it all as rubbish for the sake of knowing Jesus. That is entering into that promised land that all that was in the past, all those things are no longer anything to me because of the love I have for Jesus. Never embalm the past. We wanted to die and rot and go away. In the same way you didn't want to take that manna and put it in a jar and keep it because it would get rotten, listen, that represents our past because we're walking in the promise. Amen? Amen. And so we get to enjoy that. And it, Here, let me end with this. If you are completely honest about your spiritual condition this morning. Where do you find yourself? When it comes to the correlation of this message, are, are you lost in your sins and you need a Savior? You, you, you know that where you are is not where you should be. The great news is, is we have a Savior that knows exactly what you're going through and He died to pay for that. You can be saved. You can repent of your sins. Those sins can be forgiven. And you can be reconciled with the God of heaven. Amen. Are you still looking for that victory? You're struggling. Whatever it is you're going through. Listen, we can also just confess that to Jesus. Repent of those things. And you can be restored this morning. Have you reached that place where you enjoy spiritual victories, that things are going well for you? Then listen, you, you need to come up here and thank Him. Give Him praise for that. I don't know what it is that you need this morning, but I do know that there is a land filled with blessing. And we can receive it by simply stooping and taking in Jesus. Let me pray for us this morning. Father, I just thank you that, um, that first, 
that we get to study your word. We get to see who you are. We, we, we get to see your promises. We get to understand what it is that, that you had promised your people, that you've given your people, that you promised us, and that what you've given to us through Christ. And so we thank you that you would send your son into this world humbly, that he would live a sinless life and die a sacrificial death for us on the cross. We thank you that you loved us that much to do that. Jesus, we thank you for loving us and enduring that for us. We thank you, Jesus, that you provided a way for us to be reconciled to the Father. I personally confess my sin, I, all of them. I am a broken and sinful thing. I ask that you would forgive me. I ask that you would forgive those that would just make that same statement before you. You had Paul write that if we confess with our mouth that you are Lord and believe in our heart that God raised you from the dead, that we would be saved. We trust in that. We put our faith in that. I pray for those that have never done that would do that this morning, Jesus. I pray for those of us that are walking in that victory, that we're in the promised land. We give you thanks. We give you praise. We sing out to you. And I ask that you would empower us to tell everyone that we know about your love, about your mercy, and about your grace and your forgiveness. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would empower us. I pray that you would speak to those hearts this morning that may be struggling. I speak. I ask that you would speak to those um, who might just not quite understand that you would empower them to understand the gospel of Jesus. We love you. Holy Spirit, we thank you. We invite you in. Jesus, we thank you. We give you praise and honor. Father, we love you. And we ask that you would use us to do mighty and great things. We pray all of this in Jesus' good name. Amen.